Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. I'm Jen with Slope Garden Center. I'm just going to talk for a few moments while we're still waiting for people to sign on. Um, I'm really excited about our fourth class in our virtual webinar series. I think this has been going great so far, and I'm super excited to see all the interest and enthusiasm. And I also really appreciate all your feedback. Um, we're really trying to make this as effective and educational for you as possible. So any and all feedback you can give would be great. I um, First thing, if everyone could uh, fill out the poll right now while we're waiting to start, we wanna use some of that information. Elizabeth would like to use that information for her presentation. So um, it's just two questions if you can fill out the poll. And then second, and I'm hoping I'm not gonna disappoint a bunch of people, um, but I realized that there was a typo in an email that went out that labeled this as a citrus pruning class. We are not gonna talk about citrus pruning um, simply because it's not the right time to prune citrus. Um, so our, we do have, Elizabeth will come back and talk about citrus pruning and that's on March 27th. So mark your calendars and the registration's up on the website right now. So you, you can register for citrus pruning on March 27th. Um, also, you all should have received an outline with the reminder email that was sent out about an hour ago. So if you want to refer to Elizabeth's outline during her presentation, the, the link should take you there. Um, there will be a recording available um, of this class uh, Monday evening. So all of the webinars, the, the following Monday evening after a recording should be available. Um, you can ask any questions that you might have in the Q&A portion. Just keep in mind that we have over 850 people registered for this class. I'm gonna try to go, you know, get to as many questions as possible. Um, but if we don't get to your questions, feel free to send a follow-up email to myself or to Elizabeth. Um, we're, we will take some time during her presentation for a couple of questions here and there, but we're gonna save the majority of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, I think that's all I have. Let me look at the poll. Uh, most people are interested in how to prune mature fruit trees. And most people are in Contra Costa County. Interesting. Okay, well, that's cool information. Um, okay, so I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today. Elizabeth has done so many on-site um, classes for us and her classes are always the most popular, standing room only. Um, based on the registration for this class, it seems like she, you know, she has the same virtual appeal. So that's awesome. And she, she'll be discussing uh, winter fruit tree pruning. And like I said, we will have some questions throughout and then have a larger portion at the end. So thanks so much, Elizabeth, for being here with us today. And we all look forward to your presentation. Um. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, okay, so my name is Elizabeth and um, I am gonna be talking about fruit tree pruning. Um, one of the things um, I wanna highlight a little bit is my company name, Go With Nature. Um, the reason why I'm highlighting this is not because I wanna uh, expose my company, but because I wanna try to uh, make a point. I am going to be talking about my experiences in pruning, how do um, I approach the trees, um, and it may go a little bit um, against the flow of the old generation thinking or the grower's attitude, uh, and it's okay. We have to adjust our pruning to 
our situations. So what I did is I used the Japanese style pruning and the thinking and the principles and the growing, the growers um, a attitude uh, principles and I adjusted and I bring it to us for our uh, fruit trees in our gardens. So yes, I am gonna be talking about the myths. I'm gonna be talking about the old approach and I am gonna question that. And I am gonna explain why I'm questioning it and maybe how I will approach the situation. So starting with that, um, here in the it's a, in the webinar, we I put there winter pruning and fruit tree pruning. So how Jen said before, we are not going to be talking about citrus pruning and how she say it's not the right time. Also, those trees grow a little bit different. We are going to be talking about winter pruning. Um, most of our trees uh, that we're going to be talking about, they are going to be deciduous trees. So that is why I also wanted to separate this because, you know, approaching a tree when it's dormant is totally different um, than um, when it's in the growing season. So um, going with this on mine, um, I wanted to, okay, my slides is not working. That's great. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I am going to be talking, um, yeah, so I'm going to be working with the cycle of the plant. So for me, it's um, really important to realize that we do have the four cycles. Maybe we are not having, um, a, you know, a snow, um, but we are seeing the different things that the trees are doing with the different cycles. So I'm gonna talk about winter season as the first because it's where we are right now, is what we are approaching right now. So in winter season, the trees are dormant. What does really mean uh, for the trees? A lot of people ask me, is the tree dead? Uh, what is happening with the trees? It's important to know. So the dormancy of the trees, um, the trees are not fully sleeping. The upper section of the tree is not doing much. So the, the winter dormancy is all about the trees slow down significantly in um, the functions. Um, they are, the root system is the part that is still really active in the tree. So um, we have to be, uh, we have that in consideration, for example, when we are doing, a, when, if we are doing the winter planting, uh, for us it's really good to do winter planting because we have a lot of water coming in, supposedly, um, with, the, with the rains. So um, keep that in mind. We also know that um, in winter when the tr trees are dormant, um, the trees are, um, is still getting nutrients, um, but they are getting nutrients from the store, uh, the storage that they put in the root system. So they are doing things, but they are doing things in a smaller scale. And the activity of the tree is mainly in the root system. So in the winter, we're gonna have cold temperatures. Of course, sometimes, you know, we are in California, and sometimes we do have like those hot, beautiful weathers that we had like two weeks ago. Uh, I love them, I don't regret them. Um, I think it's a nice little break, but at the same time, sometimes if it's dry and if it's um, um, hot, the trees start waking up. Uh, maybe the bats start showing some action. In that case, um, we have to be a little bit more protective of the tree. So what happens is when the trees go, start going to winter um, dormancy, um, they do it as a protection. As a protection, uh, they, they slow down the movement of the sugars at the movement of the flow of the water. Um, the sugars going up and down, so they don't freeze and break. Um, so when all this, when all this uh, natural 
uh, actions of the tree are being uh, are being disturbed by the same nature um, changes in the nature, what is going to happen is when the trees start waking up, it's not that they woke up, oh, this is happening, oh, okay, we're going to go back to sleep. No, they actually stay kind of like halfway awake. So a lot of those protections that they were having for the winter dormancy are already kind of like off. So we have to be a little bit more protective. So if you are having uh, your fruit trees, like for example, we had that um, when we have those really uh, drought um, winters, um, when no rain, lots of heat, um, they were producing flowers, they were leafing out, they were producing fruit. Some of the trees were producing fruit. So what is happening is the storage energy that is in the root system is being used. So when a spring comes, that spring, the growth is going to be less because they already use a lot of that storage in the root system. Um, all these sugars and all these is, is starches. So it is really important that we um, adjust um, and expect um, what and protect our trees of what could be happening if all these conditions are actually not happening or being a little jet, uh, change, we have to adjust. Um, we don't have to be really concerned about frost here in California. I do have to say that one of the things that I realize is when it's really, really cold, like um, we have uh, some cold weather uh, yesterday and the day before, um, no, not yesterday, but the, the days before. So when I am doing my pruning and I am cutting, I realize that a lot of my branches are snapping. Um, so um, I end up, I have to be really mindful in trying to use instead of you know using my loppers and forcing to cut, using my shears and forcing to cut. I'm gonna use a lot of my saw um, to do those cuts. Um, also, we wanna know um, we don't have to protect our trees from uh, pruning. If we do the pruning, we don't really have to protect our trees um, after the pruning from uh, frostbite. Um, we have mild, still mild uh, cold temperatures. So um, I will say there is no problem with that. The other thing that we have in the winter is the chilling requirements. Um, and is the, I put it here, is the amount of hours um, under certain temperature, usually it's 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, some of the fruit trees like cherries and um, some apples, um, uh, they have a specific requirement that uh, it needs to go through. Apricots are really like I had a lot of uh, issues with apricots not producing in mild climates uh, and it's due to the amount of chilling requirement that they need. So this is actually pretty important. The flower may appear but the fruit will not be produced. Um, so we have to look at that. So what are we going to do in winter? We do something that is called winter pruning. And I'm putting it here uh, just because I wanna make sure that we have a differentiation between, between what we do in winter, what we do in spring and stuff like that. So, and also you can research what is winter pruning. Um, so we do winter pruning. Uh, what is winter pruning? We work in the structure of the tree. So our trees are bare naked right now. They don't have leaves. Um, they are dormant, how I said. So it's really easy to look at them and figure it out what is really happening with the tree. And I'm gonna give a few examples of this. Um, I, winter pruning is one of my favorite prunings uh, because it's actually, I go really fast with winter pruning um, because it's easy to work around, see everything and, um, and um, yeah, see what I need to do. So the second season, the next season that we're gonna be um, looking at uh, that is coming is a spring season. So in a spring season, what the tree is doing is having this first set of growth. That growth comes from the, root, the energy stored in the root system, how I said before. So this is a really important, um, really important uh, thing to keep in mind uh, because then we're gonna relate our seasons. 
So if this is stored energy, um, gets disturbed by weather, by irrigation being cut, by uh, temperatures, uh, warm temperatures in winter, our spring growth is gonna be different. So um, we wanna keep that in mind. Some of the some of the trees will flower before they grow. Um, so that means um, we need to keep in mind that our flowers in the, in the fruit, in the most common fruit trees in our uh, region are um, overwintering in the tree. So that means the flower is already there. So yes, we are cutting some of these flowers and it is okay. The way that I'm approaching pruning, you're gonna see that you are gonna be cutting things, but you are gonna be renewing things and things are gonna be growing. And if you do what I call maintenance pruning, you are not gonna have problems um, with um, cutting some of your flowers. Um, so in a spring, we are gonna do, we're gonna see the first growth and we're gonna see the flowers. Um, in the spring, the temperatures are mild, we have some rain and we have some frost. Usually I don't do pruning for deciduous trees in spring. And the reason is because the reaction is just gonna be really strong. So in winter we do, dor we do dormant uh, uh, pruning or winter pruning um, and the reaction in that moment is nothing. Nothing is gonna happen for the pruning that you did at that season. What is gonna show is gonna show in the spring. The reaction is gonna be in the spring. Um, in winter, it, the, the winter pruning that we do, it invigorates the tree. So that is why fruit trees are usually pruned in winter. In spring, if you go and cut your deciduous trees in the spring, what you're gonna do is you're gonna bush out your spring. You, you, you're gonna have double reaction. You are gonna make your tree grow a lot of vegetative growth. So usually, and I put it here, the only pruning I do in the spring um, for fruit trees is the citrus pruning or you know avocado, something like that. So they are the evergreens. Um, that is a good time to do your citrus, your, your, um, your citrus pruning. Then comes summer. In summer, what are the trees doing? The trees getting focused in the fruit and get it, you have your second growth. So um, at this time we have hot temperatures and we have no rain. So we are already feeding our trees. If you have a plant that produce flower, produce the fruit, and then the fruit drops and you don't see no fruit, but the fruit is all in the ground, all green, not even mature. That means your tree is not getting enough water. So they, are, they naturally just drop the fruit. Most fruits, most fruit trees, because it's part of the nature, are gonna produce an over, uh, they're gonna produce a, a big, like a, a excess, grow excess uh, fruit and then they drop some and that is natural. But if you are just having a, a fruit drop of 90%, 70%, so the, the tree is telling you, I'm not having enough water in the time I need it the most. Um, so in summer, I do, I do have summer pruning. I do summer pruning in my fruit trees um, and I am not cutting the fruit. I am actually, my summer pruning is about working in that reaction growth from the winter pruning I did. So my pruning is related, I cut in winter and then I follow up in summer. Um, I do a lot of thinning. So whatever cut I did before, I'm gonna see how it reacted. Um, I'm gonna see if I need the growth there. And if I don't need it, I remove it. I work in the upper section. So I have that air circulation and light coming in. Um, I have, in summer, I put here a special occasion pruning. So what happened with this is how I say, I'm working with the tree, I'm working what the tree is doing, and I'm working with our environment. So I have, and I have done this many times, um, when I have trees, like my, my like a cherries or plums, or apricots um, that they, if they have any diseases that are, and even pears, that they have diseases that are related with having open wounds 
um, in winter with the rain, uh, the disease will get in the wounds and get in the tree. Um, I don't want to do pruning at that time. So for example, fire blight or cankers, any of those cankers, if you see your tree oozing a lot of sap and getting all dark, nasty, uh, sappy uh, points in your tree, um, I don't usually do winter pruning in those trees. I do the special occasion pruning. So that means in summer, I tell my client, in summer, as soon as you do your harvest, so if you're harvesting your plums, if you're has harvesting your apricots, if you're harvesting your cherries, as soon as you do har harvest, I'm gonna come and do, and do my winter pruning in summer. And so I am doing one pruning, but instead of doing it in winter, I will do it in summer. So that's why I put a special occasion pruning, meaning I'm not gonna do winter pruning and I'm gonna go back and do summer pruning in these trees. No, what I do is I don't prune in winter and I just go and do summer pruning. Do I'm cutting the amount of flowers and fruit that they're gonna produce? No the amount of flowers and fruits that they're gonna produce are gonna actually, a lot of the people say, the first years are even more. Why? Because I am giving the tree the time to grow and produce that flower, but, and winter, uh, over winter the flower, but. And so for the next year, we will produce a lot of fruit even maybe more fruit than how it was producing before. So you can do that with trees that are, being, that are sick and that um, the illness or disease that they are having is related with rain and open wounds uh, transmission. So then we have fall. In fall, this is actually a really important season. Um, and I wanna bring it up and I wanna highlight it because I realize a lot of the times people don't um, realize how important this season is. This season is kind of like our a stepping stone of the year. So in this season, if I have to fertilize my trees for X, Y, or J, fall season is, is, a, is a really good season to fertilize. Why? Because in fall season, we, my tree is putting the storage is, is putting the nutrients in the root system. It's storing them there. So in the fall season, the tree is preparing for dormancy. When the tree prepares for dormancy, all the storage uh, nutrients that they have in the bark and in the, in the stems and in the branches is being moved to the roots. So you don't wanna disturb a lot of the root system in your established trees. You want to fertilize at that time because that is not is gonna is gonna help your tree for the um, putting a lot of nutrients in the storage in the in the root system, and that is gonna be super good for spring growth. You want to make sure that your tree has water. If you put fertilizer, but we have the ground, I don't we have the ground dry. At that time in California, we don't have rain, no rain. So we have fog. That doesn't mean that the, 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 the tree is being able to get a lot of nutrients in the root system. So it is really important that we realize a lot of people make this mistake. As soon as it, they don't, uh, the fog starts, they cut the irrigation. I have a lot of trees getting stressed for this uh, because of this action. It is really important that you realize that even though we have really long morning fogs um, in the area, like Berkeley, El Cerrito, Mill Valley, um, what else? Sausalito, they get those really um, long morning fogs that can last to 11. Then at 12, the sun comes out and it's, it's hot, it's steaming hot the rest of the day. And if you don't have irrigation in your trees, that is when your trees start getting stressed. So you're gonna see the problem in spring. You're gonna see the problem in summer. You don't see, you, don't, you may not realize it that fall, but you are gonna see it next year. 
So it is really important that you realize for the best time to fertilize your fruit trees if you're having any problems with them will be fall. The, the, the other next time to be really good to fertilize your tree, it will be spring. Um, I don't usually fertilize in summer just because they are getting focused with the fruits, but yeah, you can fertilize in, uh, in, um, in summer. The reason why I don't usually do it is because I want people to be mindful of what type of fertilizer they put. In this case, I would say put organic fertilizer, put natural fertilizers. And I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail with this. Let me finish the fall season. So in fall, this is really important. We're gonna have the fall color. The fall color is also really important because as soon as the tree has that fall color, that means they stop photosynthesizing. So that means, you know, now putting fertilizer is good for the storage, but it's not good for any growth. Um, if I go and do, um, you know, my winter pruning at that time with fall color, yes, I'm actually doing winter pruning. The tree is gonna have the same reaction that the winter pruning. So fall color is an indicator for us. Where is the tree? The tree is, is done growing for the year. So I, when we have those really dry, uh, um, dry winters, we have trees producing fall color in summer. So that's why I, for me, it's really important to be mindful of what, you know, I used to say what the tree is telling you. And people is like, hey, are you talking with your tree? What the tree is telling you? And people laugh about it, but the truth of the matter is if you take your time to observe your tree and what your tree is doing and what are all the signs of the fall color, the growth, the putting flowers in winter and what that means, you are gonna be able to understand what is happening with your tree. So if you have fall color in summer, your tree is gonna have problems in a spring because, because they may not be able to get a lot of that store, store nutrients in the root system. So maybe, you know, if I am gonna have, um, if I'm gonna try to help my tree, I am gonna actually put some um, water in fall and keep it kind of like here and there watering um, if I decide to cut my irrigation. So water is really important in fall. Fertilizer is really important in fall. If it's fall color, the tree is done for the year in the growth. And everything that you have to do is maybe keep adding a little bit of fertilizer and for sure keep that water on the tree. Um, I do fall pruning. Um, the fall pruning I do, and I, I put here reduction. If I have a tree, that I am kind of like battling to keep it small because it grows way bigger than I can even, you know, imagine. So one of the things I'm gonna do is fall pruning. I, I'm gonna put, I am putting this here, but I do wanna highlight this in red, meaning be careful. Fall pruning will really stunt your trees. So I only do this and I put it here only Oh, I, for, I have a, a spelling thing. For a strong growing plants, this is supposed to be an S here. For a strong growing plants, okay? So keep in mind that. Um, okay, I don't know if um, we wanna go with any questions about the cycles, just because I want people to uh, understand um, and have clear what the relationships are. So the relationship of, Fall is related with the spring. Winter is related with the spring. Summer is kind of like the trees doing their own thing. Um, and, um, and the prunings, I am gonna explain a little bit about the pruning. So the winter pruning, um, so how you can see you have here three prunings that I can do a year. Usually I prune two times a year or once a year. If I have to select and what is the most important pruning of the year, it's gonna be the winter pruning. If you're gonna skip any pruning, skip all the prunings, don't skip winter pruning. Um, I do follow up. 
I do follow up and I do uh, my follow up in summer. My, my, uh, the, and then the fall, I only do it for trees that I'm working in reducing and I am having a battle with them. So it's not that I do three times pruning a year for fruit trees. Um, and this is only for established trees. So any questions um, about uh, this? Hi, Elizabeth, great information. This is really awesome. Uh, a lot of people are asking about olives, figs, and pomegranates. So where would you place those in, in the um, pruning cycle? Okay, so great. Olives, um, I would say uh, spring pruning, I do olives uh, in the spring. Uh, you can do um, white because in that case, if you want, um, for two reasons, the olives, a lot of the times people don't want the production. So if you do late, late, um, late pruning, you are actually cutting some of the, um, the flowers, so you are gonna reduce your production. If you want production of the olives, you are gonna do early spring pruning. Um, so like that, they will grow and the growth, uh, the fruit is gonna produce in the new growth. Um, what was the other one? Sorry, uh, fig and pomegranate. Uh, figs, yeah, figs is gonna be like a winter pruning. Uh, um, usually I do winter pruning. Actually, one of the things I use fall pruning was for a huge fig tree that um, they, the new owners of the house wanted to, they were going to remove it. And they asked me, can you actually make it smaller? So I actually did fall pruning uh, for three years in this fig and I was able to reduce it. I do have to say that, you know, when you do fall pruning, for a fig, um, you can actually not only ready, like it will stunt the tree, so it will not produce a lot of fruit. Uh, but figs are usually gonna be like your winter pruning, um, and I don't usually do summer pruning unless that I need it. Um, and what was the other one? <laughs> pomegranate. Pomegranate, okay. The pomegranates um, are, um, yeah, you are, can do, you are gonna do your winter pruning. So pretty much um, you, uh, they are gonna uh, grow and in the new growth, um, there is gonna be the fruit. So you are gonna do your winter pruning in there. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. I have first, okay. So terminology, I am gonna go a little bit quick with the terminology because you know, you can actually, do this yourself, but I do want to be able to communicate straightforward with you guys. So I am just going to give you um, the quick uh, summary of the terminology. Um, so we have most of our trees right now are grafted. So we have something that is called the graft union. So the graft union is really important. So the scion is the upper section of the tree. That is the tree that you actually want. Those where your apples are that you want, your pear that you want. All, most, of, most of the fruit trees right now, citrus, uh, all of them are being grafted. And this is something that they have been doing because they realize that um, makes the tree less susceptible to root crown. Um, so the graft union is a really important part of the trees, our fruit trees right now. You don't want to put anything in the root crown. You don't want the root crown to be um, damaged uh, by water. You don't want to put any, um, you know, some people put this stuff for the ants not to be going up or the deer not to scratch the the bark, they put stuff on them. Try not to put anything on there uh, because if humidity gets in there, that graft uh, becomes moldy and this is what is happening. So it can get damaged. And then you have a tree that is having problems surviving. So when you are buying your tree also, you wanna make sure to look at the graft. A lot of the people buy the tree looking at the foliage 
and I will say if you are buying a tree, you want to look at your graft and see if you have a good graft. So these are good grafted trees. Um, this is a graft that is having an issue, that is why it's in red. Anything that is in red is problematic or no, no, in this presentation. Um, this is a graph that had a little bit of an issue, uh, but it's still healing. Um, so the, 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 the scion is the upper section of the graft. The root, uh, the root stack is the lower section where the root system is. So we want to make sure that we have um, that, um, that side, that root stack. Um, uh, uncover from um, I, pretty much what I'm trying to say is right now we see a lot of the trees being planted like that where the root stack, stack is um, being uh, covered by soil. Uh, try to make sure that you can actually find the root crown. The root crown is that little neck uh, looking thin where the trunk meets the root system, that root crown is really important. You want to be able to serve the root crown. You don't want to cover the root crown with anything either. Um, right now, how I say, that is why we have a lot of fruit trees green, being grafted. So the root crown is a little bit less susceptible to root rot. But um, if you have like an older tree, if your tree is mature and it has been there for 30 years, most probably it is not grafted. So you are not gonna see that. So most probably you do wanna be able to see your root crown and um, not having a lot of things covered. So if your root, if your soil is at this level, that means your root system, uh, your root crown is covered um, and um, your tree can be having, you know, uh, issues in the long term. So you want your, your soil level to be right below the root crown, no above the root crown, no close to the graft. The leader, the leader is something that we're gonna talk about it when we are gonna be reducing the tree. You can have one leader or two leaders. The important thing with the leader is because when we reduce, we wanna, I'm gonna say, okay, let's span our leader, you're gonna find it. Um, the main scaffolds or the structure of the tree is something that um, I put here the structure because I say that a lot and I know I have an accent. Um, but the main scaffolds or the structure of the tree is something that is gonna really help you to visualize um, what is happening with your tree. So it's, re it's a really important part. So in this case, in this tree, my branches or main scaffolds are gonna be this one, this one, this one, and that one. And before I do anything, I always take a moment to visualize where are my main scaffolds and what they are doing. And we're gonna go through that. The branch crashes, sorry, the branch crashes. That is a really important uh, thing. It sounds kind of weird, but it's a really important because the crash is gonna give us, we're gonna be looking at these crashes all the time, mature, young, Every pruning, we're gonna look at these crashes and we're gonna see where, what they're doing, how is the angle, where they're located, and um, how they are doing. So the crash is the part where the branch meets the trunk. So we wanna look at those crashes. We wanna have, they say here, a weak crash. Why? Because if you have sharp angles, that, that crashes become weak. This is a strong, crash because we have a nice angle. So you want usually a 45 to 60 degree angles in these crashes. So um, with the way they open up a little bit and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But I say, if I say, look at your crash, look at your angle, this is what I'm referring to, the branch collar. So the branch collar is something that is really important. And I am really glad that right now is being talked a lot. The branch collar in this case, this is the branch collar, the shaded area here. We wanna put right above the branch collar. The branch collar is gonna give you the directionality of your cut when you are cutting to the trunk. So in this case, this is my branch collar. Some of the trees like the cherries are really beautiful because you can totally tell where the branch collar is. 
um, you don't want to cut the branch color. So this is a, no, no, it's in red. So they went and cut really flat. They did a flat cut. So they cut the branch color. The reason why the branch color is so important is because it has the cells that help the tree compartmentalize. So meaning they wall off those wounds. So it is really important we don't cut the branch color. Um, the vegetated buds, the flower buds, um, that is really important just because you wanna be able to figure it out what you're cutting and what is gonna happen. So in here, we have a vegetated bud. You see how close to the stem it is. You see how flat and pointy it is. This is a, a vegetative bud. Vegetative buds only growth vegetative. So pretty much this is, if I come and cut here, oh, sorry. If I come and cut here, what I'm gonna get is this growth. This is a flower bud. So the flower buds are fat, are, um, um, yeah, they are flat, they are rounded, and they have, a, they have a little bit of an angle. So in this case, this flower bud is at the end because it's in this purse. So we need to be able to understand a little bit of that that is coming in the next one. I also wanted to talk about a little bit about the bud scale, uh, which is, they say it's car, but usually it's, it's not as car, it's a bud scale. But um, it's here. And I use this one to determine how much growth I have in the tree from last year. So it's part of what my assess I do. And I have a little bit of a branch. I have a branch here that I'm gonna show you later on um, how that is. Um, so here I'm talking about um, the vegetative versus the flower. So we have here vegetative growth, um, vegetative growth in from the, um, a vegetative bud. Um, here we have the flower bud, and the thing is, this is a spurs, and that's why this flower bud is at the end, is in the in is in the in, in the tip. So what is going to happen is you're going to see here um, a little bit of having some vegetative growth in this spurs. This is this is this is, this is kind of funny. I put it here just because we have this the fruit spurs here. You can see how the fruit spurs, when they develop, develop uh, leaves. These are the only vegetative buds will never grow because they are the spurs. They will not develop long stems. They will just grow as, oh man. sorry, I don't know why my, my thing is doing this. They will just develop as, um, as this, a little, is, uh, scales in the in the spurs. So these spurs, um, we have two. I guess we have just um, the spurs are only produced in the fruit trees, and in here we have the long-lasting spurs and the flower buds. And I am differentiating that because some of the trees don't have spurs. So figs. Um, they don't have spurs. Um, olives, they don't have spurs. Um, the, the Santa Rosa plum, they don't have spurs. The Japanese plum, they do have spurs. Um, the apricots, they don't have spurs. So you can see the flower bud here is usually like two flowers together and the vegetative bud is um, alternated with the flower bud. So this is the vegetative bud, this is the flower bud. Um, over here, you have the plums, we have the buds here, and, um, and you have vegetative bud here. This is the spurs. In the spurs for apples, Japanese plums, pears, cherries, the spurs can last up to 10, 15 years. It all depends. So in this case, you do wanna care for those spurs. And I'm gonna show you how to develop these spurs in the tree, in the places that you want. The important thing that I want you to realize is some of the trees, the spurs last for a long time. Some of the trees will not have spurs. 
pomegranates, they don't have spurs. Figs, they don't have spurs. Persimmons, they don't have spurs. Um, so you want to be aware of that. Uh, yes, there is such a, such a thing about bad pruning. I put this here because I want us to realize that bad pruning is something that can kill. This picture, actually, when you look in the internet, this picture is, um, the name of this picture was uh, pruning that can kill or something like that. Now, I put this picture here because now, you know, even San Francisco and certain areas, they are being uh, people, cities are suing people for topping trees. So I'm gonna show you how to reduce your tree without doing this type of pruning. Um, and also, you know, when you do this type of pruning, this is what you get. So if you were trying to reduce your tree because you wanna reach to your fruit because it's too tall and you end up having this, which is crazier and bigger, so then um, you made your problem bigger. So if we do the pruning in the way I'm showing, I'm gonna show to you, you're gonna realize that you can actually um, control your tree. Remember, you have two, three seasons to do some of the pruning and you don't have to cut so strong. So pruning, why we prune? Young trees versus mature trees. This is something that I'm trying to um, make people understand. And that's why one of the questions is what your interest is. So I do wanna talk a little bit about differentiating one to the other one, but we're gonna focus in this one in the, in, the, in the rest of the class. So why to prune is really important. When you are gonna do your pruning, the first, the second thing that I want you to do is why do I'm pruning? So goals of the pruning for your trees usually is to set up a structure. So the first thing that you're gonna do is if you have a young tree, young tree maybe is you just planted it, is three years old, is five years old, you're gonna do one pruning per year only. You don't, for young trees, you don't wanna prune three times a year. It is not necessary. You want that tree to get stronger. So that do only one pruning. What is that pruning done? In winter pruning versus mature trees. In mature trees, the structure is already set. I am handling the tree. I need to keep it down. You can do two prunings a year. One is gonna be winter pruning, one is gonna be summer pruning. Um, and we talk about that special occasion. Um, the pruning budget. I try to use this expression. I bring it up from somebody else, but I like that because it kind of gives you an idea how much you can cut your tree. So when you are cutting your own trees, you can cut as little bit as 10% and as much as 70%. And I'm gonna show you a few examples. That doesn't mean you have to. That's why I put here if needed. And so that is one of the things that we wanna look at and be mindful. However, in the mature trees, we do wanna have this really clear. We, if you wanna control your tree, don't cut more than 30%. So if you do winter pruning and summer pruning, you are cutting 30% in winter pruning and you are coming in summer pruning and cutting 15%, one, 5%, no 50%, it's 15%. So maybe in the whole year, you are cutting 45, almost 50% of your tree, but in one pruning, you wanna just go maximum 30%. And that is what is making the tree that is what is making you to be able to control the size of your tree. The less that you prune, the less reaction you're gonna have and the easier it is to control your tree. What are you gonna do in this in the young trees? In the young trees were selecting the structure. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Your main goals is to develop the main scaffolds and Sadly, but for surely, you don't want the, the fruit tree to start producing after in the first two years. First two years after planting. This is really important. A lot of people buy the tree and is so excited that they have fruit. But what happened is this, letting the fruit when you plant it makes the tree take longer 
And that's the one thing I took from learning from growers is if you don't let it fruit produce the fruit in those two years, you are gonna give, you are gonna get your tree established faster. In the mature trees, of course, our pruning is gonna be way different because we're cutting 30% because our structure is already set. So we're gonna maintain the size of the tree. We want the sunlight and the air circulation in your tree. So that is one of the things that you do. That is why summer pruning is so important because that is gonna help for that circulation at the time that the tree needed the most. In summer, when it's full with leaves, we are gonna work in the branch strength and I'm gonna show you how to work on that. Um, because when we reduce the length, pretty much, I'm gonna say right now, when you reduce the length of the branch, the branches are still getting thicker. So that is how we help the, to, the branch to get stronger. Um, and then we are gonna remove, of course, the dead disease and broken. And we are, the other goal of our pruning usually is renewing the wood. Um, and this means a lot of the times in our mature trees, we are gonna just remove some old branches that have been there for a long time. I'm not talking about the main scaffolds. I'm talking about the lateral branches or secondary branches. Um, we're gonna cut some of them because we have new ones coming. And that is what we do with the renewing wood. The one thing that we have in common for both of them is the branch angles. We always, in any situation, in both, in any time of um, the um, growing, in, the, in any age of the tree, we want to look at these angles of the branches. If we have sharp angles, we're gonna have long-term consequences. That is a no-no. That is why cutting 30% is better than cutting a lot, cutting 50 or cutting 60% of your tree. Because what happens is if you cut too much, the tree is gonna react with a strong growth and this strong growth is not gonna be attached really well. It's not gonna have good angles. So we wanna have good angles. Um, and if we cut less, the tree is gonna have that regular growth habit that they usually have. So it is really important to have um, regular growth. So we have good angles um, and then the attachment is okay. We don't have problems with that. And then we're gonna keep one branch for each crutch or point of attachment. So we don't have a lot of the times when I was saying, well, we are gonna talk about these crutches a lot. Well, because a lot of the times branches will grow in the crutch. You don't want, if the, if the mature tree already have the main scaffolds, one of the things I do, no matter how beautiful it looks or how much I needed it, if a branch is growing in the crutch, I'm gonna cut it, no matter what. Just cut it. Why? Because we don't want to weaken those sections. Structurally, the physiology of the tree makes those branches weaker when you have another branch growing in there. So you want one branch for a scrap, for a crutch, and you don't want branches growing on them later on, not even for fruit. Um, okay, um, any questions about young versus mature? Um, not young versus mature, but a lot of people are asking about espalier trees, espalier, or how do you say that? Espalier, okay. Um, and, and the question is how to... How to prune. Okay. So are you still applying the same uh, principles, but against a wall, or how would you describe it a little different? Yeah, so for espalier, so the difference will be timing. So for espalier, I will do the three to four times a year pruning. And I do um, because I wanna control a lot of that growth. Um, for espalier, I'm gonna use, um, I am not gonna use a lot of renewal wood uh, because I already have my, my, um, my branches are limited. They are usually if you are doing formal, which means it's a flat tree with a really defined structure. Um, you are just gonna be is producing uh, spurts. And I'm gonna talk about this. 
So the, for SPLEA, the other thing that you want to do is control the growth. You are trying to make it less growth, more uh, less big growth. So that is why for SPLEA, I do my winter pruning. I do a little bit of a spring pruning for certain plants. Um, and I do like certain plants like what? Um, I do, for example, apricots. I do have spaliera because we went, when my client told me that we're going to do that, I'm like, oh, I don't know if you want to do that. Um, but they do. Uh, so I work on it. It's not an easy thing to do. You do have to prune a lot uh, for them to be able to keep them spaliered. It, it became an informal spaliered. So it's a little flat, but, um, but it's not uh, formal, meaning it doesn't have that super strict structure. Um, and then I do keep cutting a lot, reducing a lot, and wiggling down. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So in Espalier, the only difference will be I am not doing renewal wood. I am cutting the four times a year. And, um, and I am, um, if my if my structure is set, if you got your tree, you already have your set structure. Everything I'm doing is keeping that structure alive and balanced. Um, yeah. So now pruning mature trees. So this is funny. I did these drawings and I was hoping for a lot of, a, a, a different approach, but anyway, we're gonna do our best with this. So the one, the first step. Step one is yes, gather your tools and protective gear. And I never talk about this because I always feel like uh, it's not important. But you know what? I have been doing hands-on classes and um, consultations. And I realized that this is an important point. Um, having clean tools, having your tools, um, looking, being sharp, um, and um, working is important. A lot of the times I go to my client tree, uh, my clients and they come or, you know, or doing the class and the people bring their tools and they are all rusted. They are not sharp, they are all nasty. Keep your, tree, your tools clean. Why? Because you don't wanna move these scissors around. So from tree to tree, you wanna clean your tools. Even though it's your house, clean from tree to tree, not from cut to cut, but from tree to tree, for sure. And have um, my main tools is my shears, my pruning shears, and my saw. And uh, you are going to see this later on, but have your, your protective gear, have your tools. Um, the, the other thing about your one step is remember your whys. So in this case, for this sample, uh, my my goal is to reduce it in size and to make it more open and airy in this, in this example tree. And now the one thing that I do want people to, I want to encourage people to do is before you prune in winter pruning, observe your tree. This is actually pretty important and we are going to go through that. But I want you to, you know, like be mindful of that. Don't think it's a waste of time. Have your coffee, bring your tea, you know, have your cigarette on her. But please take a time to look at your tree in winter. See what is happening. Recognize what broke. Re see where the leader is. See where the congested areas are. See all the broken parts. See all the dead stuff. Identify the branches and um, and identify the flow. So the first step is, the only one that you have to do in this step is observe. Take your time to observe your tree. Now, the step two is you're gonna cut your 3Ds. In this case, in my 3Ds, I try to do it like you can still see the branches, but no, not really strong. So the darker section is still in the tree. The shaded area is already cut. So, and the red is where I cut it. So my three Ds is the first thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cut the dead, the disease and the damage. 
In this case, the only thing that is not gonna count in my 30% is the dead. The rest of the things, the disease and the damage, they are gonna be counted. Why? Because they are still alive. So you are removing, you are removing energy source and, um, and we need to count that. So in this case, that is my first pruning. Then I go back and I do another observing. I'm gonna look at identify your structure, your main scaffolds. So in this case, I didn't cut all that. Eh? I am just showing you the scaffolds. So this is what I do. This is what actually helps me how to visualize what I need to do. So this process of identifying your structure, your main scaffolds, take your time. That is really important. How do I identify them? I actually start going from bottom and I start saying, okay, this is my main scaffold. How far it goes? Okay, I have a node here and I have a node here making this main scaffold. This is my first one. Do I have a space on that? Yes, it is located right, yes. It has a nice angle, yes. yes. I like this branch, yes. Now we go to this one. I have this one. Well, this one is okay. Um, it's not growing too strong. Uh, it doesn't go too far. It's being shaded. Um, okay, oh, sorry. Now I'm gonna go to the next one. And I go like that through all the three. So in the next one I have here, grows here. So it has some growth. I have all this branching here. It have all this branching here. It has growth. Oh, I ha it has this growth here, which, you know, it forms the rest of the tree. So, hmm, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, it's kind of crowding the tree. Um, then I keep going up. I see this one. Oh, this one is the one that broke. It's kind of weak. Okay, fine. I go like that and I keep saying, okay, here I have another one. So I look at my tree growing in my structure, growing down, up. Now I do the one backwards. I go from up, down. So I say, okay, now I identify my leader. I see how, which one is, in this case, this is my leader because it's the highest point. I, I, I point out the highest point and then I go down and I wanna see how this, where this starts. Well, this leader starts from here. So guess what? This is, oh, I didn't talk about this. This, I forgot about talking about this. <laughs> go back to this. Okay, this is a water sprout. So a water sprout is this a strong growth that goes vertical in your tree. So this is water sprouts. And we have the suckers here. People always confuse suckers and water sprouts. So water sprouts are those two that are going up that this little um, drawing looks confusing because of the arrows, but these are the water sprouts. The suckers grow from the root system. So what happened in this, um, in this drawing is that this water sprout was left for a long time and become their own tree in the tree. So water sprouts are not a bad thing, but if you let them grow, what happens is it weaken the branches. It takes all the energy from the branch because we have to realize that when the branches grow vertically, those branches are the strongest one. More horizontal, they are less strong. So when we have a strong vertical growth, most probably it's gonna take over. So that is why a lot of the myth about the water sprouts. In this case, maybe we don't want this water sprout and we're gonna have to, you know, if I have to reduce this, most probably I'm gonna reduce the water sprouts. I can reduce it here, I can reduce it here, or I can reduce it here. I have three options. So that is the one good thing about looking at your structure without pruning anything. So, um, so we did the location, we did the flow. I do the flow going up and then I do the flow going down. So in this case, if I need to reduce my tree, identify the desired height of the tree and then see if it's possible that you can go around. So if people say, well, I want my tree to be this short, I'm gonna say, well, let me see if I can do it. And I go around and I say, well, I can prune here, I can prune here, I can prune here, uh, I can prune here. So yes, maybe I can do it or no, I cannot do it. If I can prune in this section, so for example, I can prune this one, 
Um, I can prune this one. I can prune this one. I can prune here. So yes, I can see that I can actually reduce your tree to this side. Before I do any cut, I do all this analysis. I take my time to see if I can reduce it, if I can, um, if, I, if, if, if I am gonna unbalance the tree um, and where do I am gonna get my 30%. So, and then I start. So we already did the first cuts so they were the 3Ds. Now the second cuts that we're gonna do is the three Cs, competing, crowding, and crossing. So in this case, before I do any cutting, usually what I do is I check my branch. And by checking my branch, what I am trying to do is trying to figure it out how many branchlets are in that branch. So in this case, I cannot check, but I color it. So in this case, I'm seeing that all that was part of the water sprout. So I decided if I have to reduce the tree, that is one of the cuts I'm gonna do. So I go and cut it here and I reduce all this. So now I have my tree and then I do, okay, well, the other thing I can do is the, uh, the competing. So in this, I have one, two, three, four branches growing at the same, in the same side. They are competing. They are all growing in the same side, not in the same location, but in the same side. So yes, I'm gonna cut one of them. I'm gonna cut this one because by cutting this one, I'm also being able to reduce. I can cut this one because I have one in the bottom and one in the top that are gonna fill up my space. So I'm gonna cut that one. Then crowding, this branch broke. This branch is crowding the other branches. I can cut that one. Uh, crossing, I have few of those uh, growing up. They are crossing, I'm gonna reduce them. I'm gonna reduce this one too. I didn't do this one, but I'm gonna do it. So now I say, okay, now I did all my Ds, not all my Cs. So um, I am gonna look at my percentage. So usually what I do is I look at how many branches I have in the ground, how many branches I have in the tree. So now I cannot do that here, but I, what I did is I pull the old drawing and the new drawing. So right now I say, okay, all the things that are uh, shaded looking are the ones I cut. So I'm already cutting a lot. This is the way it's gonna be for right now. I already cut my 30%, a little bit more than my 30%, I will say, um, because of that water sprout. Um, remember, I only did one, two, three cuts, and I already cut 30%. So I am gonna let it go. Um, and later on, I could reduce the height. Um, I could reduce a little bit of that height uh, in summer and work a little bit more in the height in the next, in the next winter. So that will be my winter pruning for this year. And what determines when to stop if I have cut 30%. I did cut 30%. It was mainly in the upper section and I did only three cuts. Why? Because I look at my structure. As soon as I work in my structure, the rest of the thing is gonna be done. I am not cutting all these little thingies right now, no, knowing this sample. Now we're gonna do one that I'm actually gonna cut, do more cuts and keep it, um, keep it still my 30, doing my 30%. So this is it. So here is my tree. I'm gonna look at my structure. My structure in this one is red. So I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna see the structure. I'm gonna have this one here. So this is the main structure here. Um, I, have, I see some crossing here. Um, when I look at my structure, I'm analyzing, oh, okay, this is the crossing, this is the crowding. Um, I see, so I don't go through the little things, I go to the main ones. I see the distribution, I see good angles. Um, and I say, okay, the, what is the goal of this tree? The goal of this tree is reducing it, it's too tall. So in this case, I'm gonna go and start pruning. So how did you, pr how did you reduce? You cut, to, you cut to a branch led. So in this case, I wanna cut this section here. 
I went and cut all these little ones here. I went and cut the main parts. Oh, well, this part was a mistake, actually. I actually went a little bit deeper with this cut. I just started cutting and then I realized, well, you know what? If I go lower, I can make this a little bit more open and a little bit grow more a little bit this way. Um, this branch, for example, when I look at my scaffolds, I realize this branch is crossing. So I'm gonna cut one of them. So I went and cut this one because this one, I want to generate more horizontality in my fruit trees. Um, the more horizontal the branch is, the more growth, the, the more um, fruit is gonna produce. Uh, the less growth is gonna have. Um, so I wanna produce more of the horizontal branches. So I'm cutting this branch. And then in this crowded here, which one I select? I select to remove the one that is going up. Again, I am gonna try to keep more of that horizontal growth and remove some of that up, upper growth. The more vertical the branch is, the more vegetative growth you will have. The more horizontal my branches are, the more fruit is gonna produce. Okay, I guess we will have in questions, uh, a little bit of the questions about a mature tree pruning or structural or anything? Well, there's several questions and I've written down some for the end of the presentation. Um, people, a lot of people were asking because you did mention about not having the young uh, fruit tree, you don't want to encourage fruit in the first two years. So a lot of people were asking, how do you discourage fruit on young trees? And is it okay if the tree has already started fruiting um, and it's, it's under two years old? What do you do? Okay, great. That's a great question. So when the trees are newly planted, um, you can do many things. I usually try to control or tell my clients because I don't do that. But I tell my clients, strongly suggested, to remove the, fl right, the flower. No, don't even let the tree flower, is what I tell my clients. And the reason is, the less energy that the tree is putting in doing something else, the more that is putting in all the root system. So if I see my trees producing flowers, you just have to, with your hands, pick that flower, pick that flower. If you know you wanted that flower or you were not there, uh, you can cut it anytime. Uh, you can remove the fruit anytime um, in the growing season of the fruit, uh, in the developing of the fruit. You can cut it anytime. So I will cut. You can cut, uh, you can go right above where the fruit is hanging and cut the fruit. Usually just pinching with your, with your hands is, um, with, your, with your nails is, 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 um, is possible. So a lot of the time, don't tear, don't pull. You just pinch, pinch. You can pinch the flower, you can pinch the fruit um, and any size of the fruit. The longer that you leave the fruit, in the tree, the less that you are, um, the less, um, uh, hey, how do I say the, uh, this? Um, the longer that you leave the fruit in the tree developing, the more energy you, your tree is putting in that task. The, fast, the, is, the sooner that you remove it, the less energy that your tree put in the task. So, and the more energy that it's gonna put in settle, settle the root system. So you can do it anytime. You can do it by just pinching the flowers, by pinching the new fruit, or by just getting your scissors and cutting right above where the fruit is. Um, okay, so we are gonna be talking now I don't know why I have to do this, but I have to. Okay, so now, pruning cuts. 
I put that at the beginning. I am not gonna talk about uh, terminology for the pruning cuts, but I do wanna talk about pruning cuts in the sense of what it does when you cut, what is the reaction? And this is when I bring the Japanese pruning and the you know orchard growing pruning and do my own thing. So and and and, and it works. So the first thing that we want to do and i want if you learn something in this class is learn this one cut to something that is my my mantra right now cut to something you can cut to a bud you can cut to a branch and you can cut to a trunk so the reason why you want to cut to something is because the tree is able to compartmentalize, close off or react if you cut to something. If you cut to nothing, so then the tree is not being able to do anything because they don't have the structural, the physiology to be able to close that wound. So if you, the smallest cut that you can do is cut to a bud. If you are gonna cut to a bud, cut to a bud in the current year growth or the last year growth. You don't wanna be cutting to a bud when you are cutting to a trunk. So I had, I did have that happen when I went to my clients and uh, instead of they calling me before they did the pruning or when they were doing the pruning, they cut me up, they called me after they did the pruning. And somebody had cut to a bud, how I say cut to something, you say I cut to something but the bud was in the trunk. Or if your branch is, you know, um, it has a diameter of a coin or something like that. So then in that case, you don't wanna cut to a bud. So you only cut to a bud in the current or last year growth. Why? Because you wanna do good transitional cuts. And this is a principle that you don't get as a grower, uh, but this is a principle that you get in you know the bonsai pruning and the uh, uh, Japanese pruning, but that principle is actually pretty useful. Why? Because that is gonna make your tree react in the way that you want. And you are able to control your tree. So when you cut to a bud, um, you wanna do. Oh well, I already go about, talk about that. Uh, so you are gonna do good transitions also. Um, to um, having, uh, okay, well, let me start again over. When you cut uh, to a bud, you're gonna cut to the current or last year growth, only in that situation. When you prune a branch, you are gonna cut to a branch leg. So in this case, I'm cutting a branch. I wanna also work in my transitions. So in the sense of what? The thickness of the branch I'm cutting, the thickness of the stem, it's gonna relate with the thickness of the stem I'm cutting to. So this is the, the relationship. And this is the relationship. So if I am cutting this branch, I wanna be close in size and this stem I'm leaving or this stem I'm leaving. I don't wanna be cutting to a little twig. I don't wanna be doing cuts that are so strong that the branch I'm leaving is a quarter of the size of branch I cut. Why? Because the reaction is gonna be crazy. I'm gonna have a really strong growth. I'm gonna have bad connections. I'm gonna have double the size. And so that's why good transitions is something that I still do even for fruit tree pruning. Um, how much do you cut also is, is something that is gonna tell me um, what my tree is gonna do. So in this case, tipping, um, I wanna do, if I cut to a bud, and this is my last year growth, we were talking about a, that a scale growth scar, the bud scar a scale, <laughs> whatever it is. This little thing is telling me, okay, this is, the, this is the last year growth. If I go and cut one bud here, and I just call the terminal bud, I'm gonna have little reaction here. And that is gonna make my tree branch. So I do have, I do tip um, some of the uh, growth because I want branching. 
the deeper I go with the cut, the longer the growth is going to be, the stronger the reaction is going to be. So if at the end of the day I'm cutting to a bud, but I'm cutting to two buds here, I'm going to have a stronger reaction. So that is important. In the branches, the same thing. If I come and that is in red, and why that is in red? Because the size of the branch, the size, the size of this cut is telling me that this branch, the thickness of the branch, the diameter, is telling me that this branch has, was at least a good five feet tall. And if I have a five feet long, sorry, five feet long, if I had a five feet long branch and I go and cut it and I cut it and I end up leaving, you know, um, three quarters, no, actually, if, if I end up, I, I end up uh, living, you know, like um, uh, five feet tall, I end up living less than a foot, the reaction of that cut is gonna be crazy. It's gonna be a lot of growth going vertical. I'm gonna have a lot of dust water sprouts. I'm gonna have crazy movement in this in this uh, growth. I'm gonna have shoots coming in the crotchets. I'm gonna have growth developing in this section. So remember the, fruit, the, the trees are something that they react. It's not that they feel, but they do react. It's action, reaction. I cut a lot, I'm gonna have a lot of growth. So we wanna have those transitional cuts. That is why the, having the size relationship helps me to know how much I can cut. If I am cutting here, I am making that branch a little bit of stress. Why? Because the size of this diameter compared with the size of the diameter I am um, leaving or I am cutting and I am leaving is getting farther and farther. So it's gonna be more reactive. The more, the closer the transition is, the less reactive or more natural uh, growth I'm gonna have. Uh, how much I cut also is gonna determine how strong that growth in the next, in the growing season is gonna be. Um, winter branches. Mm. Also, when you are cutting to a branch lead or a branch, you are also gonna select your directionality. So that is gonna help you. So in this case, for example, if I want my tree to go that way, so yes, I will cut it here. If I want, and then it's gonna grow up a little bit because it's going up. But if I want more horizontal branching, so I'm gonna come and cut here or opening up more the tree. So this is the branch that is gonna fully develop. This is gonna develop too, but the closer to the, the branch that is close to the cut is the one that is gonna take a lot of the strong uh, energy and development. So this is the one I'm saying you need to grow strong. If I cut here, if I cut here, I'm telling this one, you need to grow strong. Um, always right above the collar, cut right above the collar. When we cut, when we do wrong cuts, um, we have, and I see that a lot in fruit tree pruning, um, just because before, you know, um, we never thought about that. So a lot of times people just cut and they didn't consider that having cut into something was important. So in this case, they cut, they cut to something, that something, that branch actually is kind of like going down and going up. The size of the branch that they cut and the size of the branch left is actually like, you know, really far away. The transition is really, strong so this is not being able the tree is not being able to compartmentalize so what you are going to end up doing is cutting here to be able to fix it this is a good cut whatever the size they did here they had good branches next to the cut that is helping this this tree to compartmentalize this wound so this is a good color also they left the color is, is, is Kali's imperfect. So this is a good cut, this is a bad cut, this is a bad cut. This is gonna have a bad reaction. Okay. Branch reduction. 
a lot of the times when we are cutting uh, the branches, here is two examples with the same branch. It's exactly the same branch. So what is going to happen is you can cut, you know, and thin out. So in this case, I'm cutting here. Um, I am having two branches uh, taking the energy of the tree. I'm not reducing. I'm thinning out. I'm cutting the one in the center. The other way to do it is, well, you know, I don't need to go so strong by cutting here. I am just going to start reducing in the um, in the length of the branch. I do that a lot for fruit tree pruning because I want to keep some of that, some of those. Um, I don't want to thin out so much that I don't have um, my wood um, to start producing spurs. I don't want to renew wood. This is what I do when I want to renew wood. This is what I do when I want to uh, keep it small, but it's still producing. Um, I always cut to something. And in this situation, it may look a little bit funny, um, but remember, whatever I cut is going to grow. This is going to grow. There are some buds that are going to develop here. They even develop in the same point that you cut. So even if you, it, it looks a little bit like it's going one way only, um, it looks funny in the drawing, but in nature, it actually works to, for reduction. Um, pruning, oh, that's so weird. I know I had another egg, egg, this one. How come I jumped this one? Okay. So in this one, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that jump cut. And the reason why I'm talking about this one is because it's really useful. Um, we don't want to cut branches. It doesn't need to be that big of a branch. But you know, when you are cutting, if you are not able to hold the branch that you are cutting. So if I'm cutting this branch here, I want to be able to hold the branch and do my cut and not let that branch fall down. Because if it falls down, it's going to tear all this area. And it's going to tear the bark. And it's going to tell the bark branch color. So it is really important that if we are not able to hold the branch, so then we reduce the turbo. Can you just stop? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm so used to he playing with the thing. I didn't realize he was doing that. Um, I am going to reduce the, the amount, the length of the branch to be able to do a, a good cut. So we call this a jump cut. Uh, jump cuts are really useful uh, because it prevents tearing of the bark. So I'm just going to go really quick with that. Turbo, stop. So the first cut that you're going to do is the lower section. Just let me get that toy out of my dog. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so the first cut that we're going to do is the number one cut, and it's the cut that starts from the bottom. So you don't have to go as deep as this drawing set. You don't have to go halfway. Everything that you have to do is cut that bark and cambium layer. So you're, uh, if the branches start falling down, it will not tear all the way. It will just tear it to there. And that's it. So you're going to do that cut. That's your first cut. You go with your saw, go up, and your and your the weight of the branch is going to pinch the saw. That is when it's going to say, OK, that's enough. Uh, it's enough um, for the first cut. Then you're going to do your second cut. Your second cut, remember, you want to do your second cut in the outer section of your first cut. And it's going to be in the top. So like that, when they split, they split like that. So your second cut, it doesn't matter. This distance, he found another toe. This distance is not important. And this distance is not important. What is important is that you do your first cut and your second cut is in the upper section, in the outer section of your first cut. And then your third cut is at, right above the bark color. OK, so. Now, I know that we talk about not necessarily um, 
being uh, so engaged about this section. I do want to talk a little bit about this section in the sense of uh, pruning and planting um, and what is happening with your trees. And uh, just because people um, ask me uh, about you know removing that fruit. So the reason why uh, this was done in the old fashion is because a lot of the times, or if we get, you know, um, we will get fruit trees that are like just a twig. So that is one of the reasons why we prune a planting. Um, the other reason why we prune a planting is because a lot of the times we do have a lot of um, branches and we have a little root system. So we want to balance that. We don't want to have a lot of foliage and a root system that cannot uh, uh, sustain the amount of uh, foliage. Um, in this case, for example, this is another example that um, we actually get a lot of the fruit trees right now like that uh, in the sense of the percentage of the root system versus the branches. Some of them are like this, but mostly we have already um, a fruit trees uh, that are this way. The percentage of the uh, root system and the foliage are kind of even. Um, so in this case, if I get presented with these three examples for my clients, um, I will say yes in this one, pruning a planting, yes in this one, pruning a planting, and no in this one, pruning a planting. I will plant, I would plant this one and prune it. And the only reason why I prune it is because I want this one to start develop some branching so I can encourage and generate my structure. I don't have to cut 15. There was a, there is, you are gonna read in many books about cutting a 15 inches or 18 inches above the ground. Um, I don't a, encourage people to do that. And the reason is, um, is that is a really random thing. I will say, select where you want to prune um, according where, where do you want your lower branches to be? And also where your um, grafting union is. So because some of the graft unions are a little bit higher than these ones, this one doesn't even have one. This one is really close to the root system. So, but some of them can even go up to here. And if this is 18 inches above the ground, you don't want to do a cut that is so close to your graft union. So that is the only reason. I do this one. I will prune this one. I may just prune it here or here. I leave some of the branches because you do have branches with good angles here. It's just that really twiggy. There are too many twigs and not strong. So I want a strength. So that is why I prune this one. I also prune it because my root system versus my foliage is just, if the foliage that is gonna come out is just not gonna be balanced. So I am balancing that. Um, we have the, you know, generating a training system. So this is something that they do as growers and all orchards. And it's something that central leader versus open center. The only thing that I have to say that I bring this to the gardens is open the central leader. I do why we do it and for which trees are gonna do it. Central leader is the one that you have one trunk going in the center and you have your scaffolds um, developing um, around right, uh, in the around the trunk and in the upper sections, the most important is that you have one trunk. Um, these are more especially done for apple trees and pear trees. Um, I do have to say that the only time I have this central leader develop is when, if I am developing a young tree, is when the tree is gonna grow taller because it's, the central leader is a little bit harder to control in the height. Um, you can read about this um, in many books and how to um, develop them. The open center is done for the trees that 
produce a lot of growth a year. So apricots, figs, plums, cherries, uh, nectarines are ones that you develop open center. So you have a lot of light going in because there is gonna be a lot of growth. Um, I actually had a, done a lot of um, open centers for trees that are small trees. So pretty much if I have, I have apples that are four feet tall and really strong producers. So I do open center for them because I am trying to generate a lot of main scaffolds. Um, so I would say these systems, study them is just in the way that you wanna develop your branches and distance your branches, but not necessarily is something that you have to do with your trees if they are young. This is an old fashioned way to prune it. So, um, it's not something that I encourage people to do. Um, now, pruning a young tree. The first thing I'm gonna say, example number one, is one of the things that they, is not talked too much in many trees, in many uh, books, is about training your tree. So if you can actually pull your tree branches down, if you have good branching in the location, you know, so this, this sample has really nice branching. Uh, it's well located. Um, maybe this in, in, in the moment of the sample before they did the, the training, the um, putting these sticks in there, um, the, if you had bad angles, you wanna be able to tie them down or pull them down and open it this angle. So the, one, the reason why I brought this up is is something that we can do. So if you do that, you don't do the pruning, you just open it up. Remember, you can do pruning later on. The, the reason why you don't do the pruning is remember, when the branches are going vertical, the more vertical, the stronger the growth. If you pull the branch down, like in this case is being done, so what happens is it weakens a little bit the branch. So you want to leave the strength of the branch to, we, to, to let that branch, um, you want to open the angle, but you still want the strength. You don't wanna weaken the branch. So that is why if you are using spreaders, how this is called, or you are tying your branch down to open up the angles because you like the branch location, but you didn't like the angle of the branch. So then you are gonna just open it up, tie it up, don't cut it wait for the next season to cut it. That means next spring, next winter. Um, that is something that we uh, do with young trees that have good structure. Um, this case, for example, um, the pruning was done already. So they did reduce. So you do have, I'm looking at the structure and I'm seeing nice distribution around, a nice distribution from my, main, my first main scaffolds to my second main scaffolds. The only thing that we say about this one is, I don't know why they leave this one here. I will say if, if something, I will cut it short. I try to balance, again, we are balancing uh, the growth. So I, if I cut one of these branches at this height, I wanna cut all my branches at the same, no all, but in, if the branches are in that, uh, area, the branches at the top should be all at the same height, like the branches at the bottom needs to be some at the bottom uh, at the same height. So like that, I am balancing the growth. I don't know why this is not doing it. Um, the next one is this one. So the number three example, um, this is the tree um, and they are trying to develop a structure. They decide to go with an open center. Uh, so they did one cut and they did cut, you know, with one cut, that's why I say with one cut, you can go 1% of your budget or 70% of your budget or 50% of your budget. They did the cut here, they left this one. I do have to say that one, two, three, four, five. They have five branches. I usually go with 
four branches here and then develop the other one four. So I will go a little bit lower. I will leave one, two, three, four, and I will cut also that one. So I will cut right here. That is everything different I will do with this one. So I have four branches developing and that will be your main structure. Um, and that will be everything that you do, just one cut, this cut here. Um, the, this one, for example, will be a tree that is really well established. So you can see the strength in the branches. Uh, that is something that you wanna uh, you, you, you want to look at and analyze, um, be mindful of. Uh, you are looking at the angles of the branches. They look really good. And the thickness of the branches tell me that this tree is ready to start producing and I will let this tree produce. Uh, why? Because it's really strong and I can tell it's going to be able to hold the fruit. Um, uh, and if it's like too much fruit, so then yes, if it's gonna start leaning, I'm gonna tie it back. But I will say these trees can be led to produce. The pruning is done in this tree. So what they did is they shorter the lower branches to keep them low. And you always wanted to go to outer bud. So you keep going more horizontal. The upper branches, um, they reduce them. I particularly, we had cut this tree. Why? Because you can see how strong this tree is. And so if this is the strength of the tree and this is a one year growth, it's really strong. I don't want that bushiness in my tree, especially knowing the upper section. I am talking about balancing the strength of the tree. That will be one of the things I do. I will cut here. So I will leave from the upper section I will leave this one, I will leave this one that is coming here and I will leave this one. I will cut right here. So I will cut these three major ones that are going upwards. They are too close together, they are crowding. I don't need that. Last one is this one. They already did a lot of the thinning, um, but let's say that this is the tree that you are showing me as my client. So everything I'm gonna do is I want to say about this tree is all this crooked, this crooked branch will go. It's starting one point and it went around and twisted. That branch needs to go. You can cut it all the way because you have one here. So then this one is kind of like one parallel to each other to a point. Uh, so you can cut this one all the way. Um, and the other thing I will do is reduce the length for young trees and even older trees reduce the length. That is gonna make them branch out. So in this case, they reduce the length of this one here, or maybe, you know, um, it broke. So they have to cut this one here. So I would say I try to balance the rest of my lower branches to be somehow in that, in that um, to that height. Um, and also like in the upper section, if I have my upper branches, if I decide that my upper branch is gonna be here, so I'm gonna to try to cut my other upper branches at the same height. So everything in this tree is, I will cut this branch is kind of crooked and growing everywhere, um, twisted, and I will um, reduce the length of these ones. Um, even though this is just tipping, I may go a little bit strong with the tipping just because I'm seeing the length and the strength of each branch. So I'm gonna go a little bit stronger. They have good angles. So it's not like the tree is reacting strong. Um, so I'm gonna cut more than just the tip. I may cut just half of the length of the branch. Um, Yeah, and um, I put the glossary here for you guys to be able to, you know, if some people like to read about every definition, um, so you can do that. Suckers is that a part of the tree that grows, pretty much shoots that come out of the root system. 
uh, suckers are not as bad as people uh, think. Um, I will say if you are having issues with fruit trees growing a lot of suckers, I will say this is my approach to suckers. If you prune a sucker, they are going to come back, especially for plums and stuff like that. So what I do is I tell my clients, if it's not boiling your plants, and if it's not boiling the strength of the tree, let them be until, you know, midsummer, end of summer, and cut them there. And the reason why I wait alone is because like that, I know I cut them once and they will not come back. If I start cutting my suckers in a spring, I'm gonna have every cut is gonna produce another socket and another socket. And you can do that. Um, it's just that, again, the more that you cut, the more that they are gonna um, respond. Um, it doesn't weaken the growth in this situation. It actually kind of like stimulate a little bit more growth. So if the suckers are not weakening my top section, I will let them be. Suckers grow from the root system, okay? So in this case, they put here a sucker that is coming from the root uh, stack. Um, so you don't want any growth coming from the root stack. Anything that is growing below the, gra the graft union, you wanna remove it because it's another plant and it's gonna take the energy. The root stock is usually a strong plant, a strong plant that grows a strong vegetative growth. Most of the times what happens is, is weaken the growth of the plant that you actually want, your xylem, xylem and, um, and end up being no producers or the fruit is dry, or the fruit is too acid or whatever. So for many reasons, you don't want any branches growing below the, groove, the graft union. Um, oh, I don't know why I jumped this one. So the last thing I wanted to talk is how you produce the spurs. So when we look at the spurs um, and we um, were identifying the different spurs, we talk about long lasting spurs um, and so the idea with the long lasting spurs is that your apples, pears, and cherries, and the Japanese plum can produce fruit for a long time. It can be, you know, five years, eight years. So you want to keep those spurs. And that's why open and airy summer pruning is important. Um, so to produce these spurs, you want to use this technique, which is really simple. The, in this case, I use the apples, but most of the trees produce the spurs in the two to three year old wood. So that is something that is really important to realize. It's not that this is the two or three year old plant, is wood. So this is where I come with my little colorful example. So you have your 2020 growth here and I come and reduce it. Um, this is going to produce growth in this year, 2021. And um, so that means this growth, the green growth uh, in 2021 is going to be one year old. I'm going to cut that one. I'm going to keep it small. That is going to be what I call, oh, this is going to be my fruit wood. It's not a terminology that is used anywhere. I make it up to try to make people understand that you can actually develop spurs in um, little places in really close to your brand main scaffolds or your trunk. So what is gonna happen is this is gonna grow. I am gonna come and cut it in my next winter pruning. And, um, and so then this pink one is the one I cut and the blue one is the reaction. So the reaction is gonna be the 2013. So by the time that this is 2013, no, sorry, 2023. Um, by the time that this is uh, growing, the green one is already three years old. 20, 21, 22, and the 20s, in the 22nd, this is gonna be a three year old wood. 
So these, some of the plants are gonna start producing your spurs here. Uh, some of the apples, some of the apples are gonna for sure be producing your spurs in the green section um, of um, uh, the branch, that green branch. So that is what I mean with three year old wood. So then in the, the pink, in the 2023, the pink is gonna be three year old. So you're gonna have some of the spurs there. And that is how I develop this is spurs that you can see in your trees here. In, and that can be in your apples and that can be in your pears and that can be in your cherries. And then later on, if I need to, you know, cut all this branch, I can cut some of these branches without being so aware of I'm cutting this purse because I am doing this all throughout the tree. So in the sample, for example, in my second sample, all these little cuts I'm doing here, um, I, I can use those to produce um, that uh, spurs that I'm talking about. In my second sample, for example, that I did a lot of cutting and I left a lot of this little growth, that is what I'm trying to produce. I'm trying to produce that three-year-old wood that is gonna produce spurs. So, yeah. So that is everything that I have to say. I'm ready for the questions. <laughs> wow, well, this has been phenomenal. I can't tell you how many people are just saying how much they learned, so much information. It's really awesome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I, I'll, first of all, a lot of people are asking, will, is, will your slides be available or is it possible for them to get a copy of your slides? If so, um, we could put them on the website or I don't know what, so. Yeah, um, yeah, I can make these slides available. I will say if you wanna, um, oh, so you can uh, email me. Right now I don't have the slides available anywhere. But um, if you can email me, I can send you the slides. Okay. Um, and then uh, a lot of people are asking about uh, the water sprouts. And if you have a lot of water sprouts from a cut, do you just cut them all off? I mean, sometimes you can get a lot coming up. So do you just keep cutting those? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, and maybe that's why I have a little bit of my, uh, my board there. So for the water the sprouts, um, you, we have to see how big the water the sprout is um, for uh, cutting it. So a lot of the times we can actually use the water the sprout and reduce it and generate um, branching um, with it. So if this is, my trunk and this is my branch and I have a water sprout growing out, you know, like really strong um, and I have many. So if you look at my drawing, this is one water sprout. Um, and so the closer that the water sprout is the closer that the water sprout is to the trunk, the stronger it's gonna be. The farther that it is, the less strong it's gonna be. So when you are working with water sprouts, one, you need to realize that water sprouts in a lot of the trees is a reaction of strong pruning. So a lot of the times we, wanna, we don't wanna cut them all because what happens is if I come and cut all the water sprouts, because this is a strong reaction, uh, this is a reaction, like a strong reaction of a pruning before, you are gonna have, if you cut them all, you're gonna have triple that reaction. So what we are gonna be doing is wiggling down and selectively pruning your water sprouts. So in that case, I'm gonna come and say, okay, I am gonna cut some of these water sprouts I may stop cutting this one. I'm gonna cut the little ones all the way down. So I come and cut this one here, all the way down. Then I'm gonna come and cut the outer one all the way down. 
So now I leave this one and I say, okay, this one, I'm gonna reduce it to this bat. I have a bat here and a bat here. So I'm gonna cut that one, I'm gonna reduce it. This one that is the strongest one, I'm gonna cut it down to, so I'm cutting all this. Oh, sorry. I am not gonna cut that one. That one is there. Just, so I cut this one here. So I'm gonna wiggle down this one and I remove this one and I reduce this one. So I cut this one down here. So I am doing different things with the different water sprouts. The closer it is, I know that this one, I wanna fully remove it later on, but I don't wanna remove it all the way. Why? Because I don't wanna generate a lot of growth in this one. So what I'm gonna do is wiggle it down. I cut it and in a spring, it's gonna grow. And most probably it's gonna go and do this. So that is the growth that I'm gonna get. What I'm gonna do is in summer, I'm gonna cut and cut all that stuff out. I don't care where you cut it. I don't care how strong you cut it. You keep cutting it, keep cutting it, keep cutting. You can cut throughout all summer and fall, keep cutting it. So what happened is that is gonna make you, that cut um, react less. When that water sprout is finally growing little shoots, that is telling me, okay, now I'm ready to fully remove the water sprout. It may take two years, it may take one year, it may take, Five years. I don't know how many water sprouts you have. So in that case, when I have really soft growth, that is when I fully remove that water sprout. What is gonna happen with this water sprout that I cut here? That water sprout, because it was a really thin water sprout, farther, not so close to the trunk, most probably this water sprout is just gonna go and do this. So, I am gonna be able to work with this water sprout. I'm gonna say, oh, you know what? I'm actually gonna be able to generate some branching. And so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be reducing this to generate spurs here. I'm gonna remove this one. I'm gonna make this branch go out and I'm gonna reduce this one. So I'm actually using this water sprout, sprout and making it branching and make it wood, a fruity wood. And remove here this one. And let this one grow and the bend. So I am using this side of this water sprout. This one, I didn't touch it. Some of them I'm gonna touch, some of them I'm not. And so what's happening is by doing different cuttings with my water sprouts, um, I am actually controlling that reaction. So you don't, you don't wanna cut all your water sprouts at one. You wanna do different cuttings with the different um, water sprouts that you have. Okay, again, this has been so awesome and so many praises about your presentation. People are asking uh, what other classes you're doing. And I just wanna let everyone know, she, uh, Elizabeth will be doing a Japanese maple pruning seminar on February 20th. And then also the, the big popular citrus one um, will be March 27th. And that's all on Sloat's web, website under seminars and you can register there. And if you have further questions, I know we didn't, we weren't able to get everyone's questions. Do feel free to either email me or Elizabeth. Um, if I can't answer it, I'll forward it to her and whatever. Um, but I, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Incredible information, incredible presentation. It's a really nice day out and um, a good day to go prune your fruit trees. So uh, enjoy your weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. And you know, don't feel frustrated if you feel that when you look at your tree, you don't know what to do. Just be patient, observe your tree, do little, and 
and knowing that later on you have time to do a little more. Um, see what you did and see what the reaction was and learn from your trip. It is actually a really good experience. Just be patient. Great. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.